A man chooses, a slave obeys. Welcome to the Ethics and Video Games podcast, where we explore issues at the intersection of ethics and video games. What follows is a series of graphic, interactive scenes that we can't show you. Okay, Andy, so here's how I think about the magic circle. Right. When I think of the, about the magic circle, I, I'm imagining myself when I was like when I was like 13 or 14 and I'm playing like advanced Dungeons and Dragons. Right. And mm -hmm. me and my mm -hmm. friends are around the table and it's a, it's in uh, my uh, dining room. And um, essentially it's us, me and my friends. And then we start playing the game. And when we start playing the game, we enter the magic circle. Right. It's like mm -hmm. together we, we leave the real world behind. And we enter into a world where we are not ourselves, but we are our characters, right? So I'm like Slick the Sly, the Dark Elf Thief, right? Sure. And then once we're in the magic circle, right? Once we're in the game, right? Everything in the game belongs to the game, right? So uh, I can do things in the game that I can't do in real life, like slash your throat, right? Right. Um, right. Morality is kind of relative in this way, Right. Um, everything that I can do, right? I can, I can slaughter people. I can, I can kick people in the face, right? None of that are things we can do in real life. But when we get to the game world, things are different, too, right? When we enter right. the magic circle, things are different. That's right. All right. Now, is, is this pretty much how you see the magic circle idea? Yeah, it's largely that. We talk about the magic circle as being the moment when you agree to play a game, when you agree, like you, you, you sit down to play poker. Uh, you you step onto the field in a hockey in a you know in a in a, a, a soccer game or a football game. Um, as soon as you once you've stepped onto the field to, in order to play a game, everybody's agreed that you're, we're all playing this game. Now all these rules are different, right? We can do things and say things and be different than we can than we can when we're in our normal lives. Like you were saying, you know, like you know you can you can you know run around with a sword and hack things up. In your when you're playing D and D, and you can you know tackle people when you're playing football, and these are things that are that are frowned down upon in the real world. Yeah, not just frowned down upon, right? But sure. <laughs> <laughs> and in some cases, we can do things we literally cannot do. Like I can play a character, I can play a superhero that can lift thirty tons. Right. Right. Well, I can't do that in the real world. I literally cannot do that in the real world. So the whole world is different. Like, like there's a there's a world that you step into when you step into the magic circle that the rules are different. The rules are changed. Um, OK, now let, let's let's take this idea of uh, right of the magic circle. And I, I want to kind of bring it into the idea of fairness. Mm -hmm. Right. Because this is, for me, one of my favorite things about the magic circle. Right. And maybe about games in kind of general, right? Um, so, you know, the the world is unfair, right? Th there's so many things about the world that are unfair, right? Um, and when we compete in the world, so much of the way we compete in the world is unfair, right? I want to be a professional basketball player, but, you know, I can't because I'm 5'9", and I have arthritis in my knees, right? <laughs> I mean, it's just, you yeah. know... I. It's this or something. I have something wrong with my knees, right? Right, right. Um, I don't, when, how old were you when you realized that you were never going to get into the Olympics? Uh, 10? Yeah. I, I don't know, right? Right, right. Right. You just didn't have the talent. You didn't have... But you notice, right? So part of it is talent, but it's not only talent, right? Think about the Olympics. My mm -hmm. God, I mean, how much training do you need? I, I, I look at, uh, you know, um, girls I know who take gymnastics. Right. Gymnastics is expensive, right? Yeah. And right, you need to take gymnastics from a very, very early age, right, to be competitive, right? right. right the same right. goes with like playing music. If you want to become a concert violinist, I mean, those are, I mean, lessons can be like, you know, you start at around 35 an hour, then it's something like 100 an hour, right? right. Who can afford so, that except the wealthy? So, yeah. So, so let's, let me go back to the magic circle for a moment and just say that we, we like to think about it as like this hard line, right? But it's actually pretty porous. There are things that we bring with us into a game when we when we when we start when we sit down to play a game. It's not this we don't leave everything outside. It's not like Vegas, right? Where everything outside of Vegas and you know, you know things inside Vegas stay in Vegas and things outside Vegas stay. You know, 
it doesn't it doesn't work like that. We bring stuff with us. When we play Monopoly, we bring our wits and our luck with us. When we play like poker, we bring our money with us. Right. Um, so and when oh, we play games like tennis or like football or or competitive, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, other, other sorts of competitive sports, we bring all these things with us, like our physicality and our training and our best shoes and who can afford that, right? Right. So, okay. So let's, let's get back to this uh, in a moment, right? Because at least games have this ideal. So l let's begin with the ideal and then we'll talk about bleed and we'll see how uh, any of this works, yeah. right? So in the ideal, even though the real world is not fair and even though competition in the real world has so much to do with the luck of where you're born and how much money you have and your, you know, inborn talents, the game is at least more fair in that, right, we step into the circle of a game and the game has the opportunity to create a level playing field, right, right. where our, what, what, whatever we're controlling uh, is essentially... Well, either balanced, right? And the game designer will try to make it balanced. I'm thinking here, especially about fighting games with different kinds of characters. That's right. Their abilities are different, but they're meant to be to be balanced. Or we're right. literally playing uh, the same kind of thing. If we're playing Rocket League, right? We all have a car with the same abilities, right? Right. And um, this idea of fairness, I think, is, is just fantastic within the Magic Circle, right? It's one mm -hmm. of the big differences between the real world and the game world. This ability right. to at least have fairness as something that the world could, I, I don't know, I, I don't want to say the world could try to make because, of course, governments try to create fairness to some degree, right? But to at some least degree. The, and, and, but, I mean, one of the problems with the idea of fairness is that while we all understand what it is, um, we can't really define it very well. Like we we know that there's some there's some old 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 part of our brains that really understand fairness. I mean, animals, certain animals we've seen can understand fairness. There's sure. you know, uh, studies with monkeys and studies with wolves and studies with crows, and they all have some sense of fairness. You can see that they know when they have been treated unfairly. Well, it's interesting though, right? I mean. Um, you know, most people find it very hard to say what fair is, right? And, right. Um, you know, my students sometimes say, uh, you know, whose definition of fairness? But then when I ask them for a definition of fairness, they can't give me any definition of fairness, <laughs> right? 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 But we, because it's hard, right? But right. I mean, little kids know just like, right, just like these, uh, these situations you're talking about with, uh, you know, with animals, like they have this intuition that mm -hmm. if others, if other people or if other beings are getting more than what they're getting for the same thing, that is right. unfair, right? So you have right. the right the kid that you know, my son will tell me that his best friend gets like three hours of game time while he only gets one hour of game time, right? And that's that's not, fair, not fair, right? right? And yeah. it's like yeah. it's one of like the first uh, ethical concepts that we learned, right? And it's it's so intuitive in us. There is, by the way. Uh, uh, you know, I, I really like um, John Rawls, uh, who was a, a political philosopher, like a really big polit political philosopher in the 20th century, has this uh, theory of justice called justice as fairness. Right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really interesting. And I, I've never read many theories about what's fair, but um, his theory is, is pretty interesting. Fairness for him is essentially a lack of bias. Right. So um, essentially... Think about what fair rules are or what fair laws are. So uh, he puts it in right. the context of a country, right? What would be what laws would be fair? And we could think about it this way, and then we can see about a game world, right? Um, so Although it it's says, somewhat easier to do with the game rules because there's nothing real hanging off of it, right? Sure, you can we always have, change the can, rules. A, a start. A, the game starts, and there isn't you know thousands of years of prehistory. Right. And the uh, and there's less politics involved, less, a right? A lot less politics. Which is obviously a lot, you know. Uh, you know, I, I remember reading, I think, Miguel Seichart, uh, you know, who's a you know, game designer theorist, uh, right, who uh, called uh, games like World of Warcraft uh, uh, tyrannies, right? Because they, there is no process, right? Where EVE Online, which we'll talk about today, right, is more of a democracy, yeah. right? Or something, well, you know, not exactly, not a democracy. 
some elements of it. Some elements of it, right? It's got it's got buy-in from from players, right? Uh, World of Warcraft essentially Blizzard determines how things are going to be, and that's how things are going to be. Right. Right. And your buy-in is: Are you actually buying in? Right. <laughs> right. Literally. Right. So so here's here's was Rawls' idea, right? Essentially, he was saying, um, look. What's fair would be the rules that anyone would agree to, right? If they didn't know who they were, so they couldn't bias uh, the idea for themselves, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so you think about uh, if I'm wealthy, I might want one sort of taxation scheme. If I'm poor, I might want a very different kind of taxation scheme. And you know, we're people; we rationalize things, right? We rationalize that whatever is good for us is good. Period. So the right. idea here of justice as fairness is that what essentially uh, we would want is the principles that anyone would agree to if they didn't know who they were. So uh, imagine, right, uh, let's say we're talking about the United States. You're like a soul floating around the United States and you don't know if you're going to be like a man or a woman or, you know, uh, uh, black or, or white or Asian or Latino or uh, in an urban, suburban or rural area in whichever part of the country. Mm -hmm. You don't know anything about yourself, your religion, the education of your parents, what social class they belong to, if they have connections. And then you got to make the rules, right? Right. So you can't bias, right? To put it into... Well, I mean, yes, and one of the one of the problems that we're seeing in the game design industry, and we're and and we're trying to address it as we go, is that um, we imagine as we as we imagine the players of our games, we're imagining people like us. And so when I imagine somebody like me, I'm imagining somebody who grew up in comic books and is white and is you know middle middle to upper middle class and yeah uh, you know action figures and comic books and all that. Um, that's not everybody. Not at all. <laughs> and it's not even it's not even a large majority. Right. Right. Um, so is there a way to to think beyond that, right? For for fairness. And it's interesting, right? How this is um you were mentioning earlier how this is uh a concept that we'll probably be end end up talking about a lot. Yeah. You know, I I, I was thinking I think uh, we'll keep coming back to the idea of fairness right. just because it's so hard to pin down. I, I was thinking recently about uh, you know the the new Hogwarts thing with uh, trans issues. Oh yeah. Uh, and okay, yeah. What is fair in terms of gender representation? But l let's not go there because I'd, I'd like to have a, yeah, well, an episode about that. Yeah, I'd love to have a, an entire point. episode to talk about that. Right, right. So, um, but right, uh, uh, what Rawls says that people would think would be fair, uh, essentially, would be uh, a meritocracy. And what, mm -hmm. what he means by, a, so the idea of a meritocracy is essentially that um, you would, uh, the people that get the, the good positions, right, are, are the people who are best, right? So uh, you make it essentially by your drive and your skill. And the idea with a meritocracy, and in his case, it would be a kind of equitable meritocracy, right? The U.S., mm -hmm. for example, and most countries, almost every country is not a meritocracy. Yeah, I don't right. know if any country is a meritocracy. Right? I don't think so. Probably not, right? With the idea of, you know, if you're, let's say, born to a wealthy or educated or well-connected family, your chances of success are much, much higher than if you're not, right? But um, the idea for him for fairness is that just wouldn't matter, right? No matter where you're born, you would have the same chances of success. Now, in a video game, well, you kind of have that, right? It, or at mm -hmm. least you have the possibility for that, right? Where uh, at least possibly, um, right, there's no obvious way that something like money or connections, uh, you know, getting there, it's you and your skill and your, and, and, you know, and your, your practice and how good you want to get. And then That's you're competing right. against the game or other people. Right. And that seems fair. Right. And that's, right. and honestly, I think that's the closest we can get to that sort of fairness, right? Because there are some things that you just can't, you can't, you can't work out rules to prevent. Um, uh, or, or I should say you can, you just have to keep evolving these rules and evolving these rules and keep adding rules and adding rules and adding rules, which is what like American football has done over the years that American football has been played because there's so much money involved and there's so much stakes involved in this game. Even though it's a game, there's real world stakes involved. And so 
in a case where these things, in a, in a game where, where everything is very competitive and the stakes are very high, there's sort of an unspoken rule, which is if it's not illegal, it's mandatory. Mm. That is, if you can gain any advantage you can in some way that's not specifically illegal, you must do it. Must in what? Definitely not the, the moral sense, right? Must must in the sense of you have you have you know, you know whatever the stakes are, whatever you know millions of dollars, right? Potentially, right? Um, the employment of of a lot of people, um, uh, right? You, you you owe it to your uh, to everybody that's invested in you. You ordered in everybody that's invested in what's going on. That's right. right? To, to to do everything you can. To play as best as you can, and to and to win as much as you can. Right. Though I would say there's definitely a point where that uh, where, where where that crosses a line where your obligations to everybody involved kind of weigh against your obligations to, let's say, your opponents, uh, to to maybe the sport, to, to sure. society, right, uh, et cetera. Right. But in in terms of your opponents, the respectful thing to do is to assume that they're playing at their best as well. Yeah, or maybe to assume that uh, you know they abide by the spirit of the the spirit of the rule rather than by the letter of the rule. I I, I don't know. I, I gotta tell you, I don't really know about that. We right. actually had a conversation about that in my class uh, when we were talking about cheating. Which which actually actually let, let let's move to cheating and then we let's go back and forth between fairness and cheating. Yeah, and, yeah, because I think we're we're about we're about to step into that. Okay, so okay now. When you think about cheating, right, the, the way that most people uh, think about cheating is to cheat is to get an unfair advantage over uh, the competition, right? Right. Um, and, um, right, this is essentially, there's lots of ways that you can do it, right? So if I, if I get a, an aimbot and we're playing like a game that involves shooting and, you know, my character just automatically hits you every single time. Right. right. That is usually an unfair advantage. And I say usually sure. because there are some situations like uh, maybe I suck, which I do, and I'm trying to play with like my nephews who are awesome. And, you know, this cheat is the only way I can have a you know, a chance to be remotely competitive. Then right. In that case, it's more like a handicap, right? Right. Right. We're leveling the playing field. Yeah. Right. And we're leveling the playing field. In this case, I don't know if we're doing it because it's more fair. I think we're just doing it so it's more fun. Right. Right. And, um, and people will give up a lot for fun. They'll give up fairness for fun. Yes. And you know, I I think these. It's, I think it's important to kind of recognize that these are both values, right? Mm -hmm. Fun is a value. Fairness is a value. And you know, these values can can, can conflict sometimes, right? Um, okay. Can, can, can we bring in, can we bring in Eve online? Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. Okay. Let's do it. Okay. So Eve online, uh, a super, super interesting game. Uh, so many things happen on Eve online. And, um, the one we want to talk about, uh, particularly today is a particular case that happened in 2005. So, mm -hmm. okay. So here's, here's what happens. Uh, in 2005, you have, um, the Guiding Hand Social Club, which is a mercenary group in the game Eve Online, they infiltrate an organization and, and they do it all over the course of like a year. They assassinate its leaders. They steal in-game assets worth uh, $16,000. Uh, that's uh, that's the real value of those assets. Um, and there's in one sense, there's nothing new here because Eve is like, it's almost anarchy. Right? It, it's full of like stealing and betrayal, <laughs> right? It's uh, the Wild West. It's meant, it's designed to be and and feel like the Wild West, but it's out in space. Okay. But, you know, still are there limits to what can happen in this Wild West, right? So how far can you take this like stealing and betrayal before it really counts as cheating? Now, what is makes what makes this case really interesting for us is really kind of how this group did it, right? So uh, what they did it is they uh, they got the information they needed to infiltrate this organization outside of the game. So as I understand it, what they did is uh, uh, they used a uh, private chat and, and, uh, and private forums that were outside of the game to, um, with the pretense of they're completely uninvolved uh, people. They're not really, um, they're not really involved in Eve Online, and I'm not sure how how exactly they presented themselves. 
I'm interested in the idea more than really what exactly happened. Right. Um, <laughs> right? But essentially, imagine, right? You're not playing the game. You're not logged into the game. But you are in some sort of form somewhere uh, on the web. And someone's figured out who you are. Right. Let's say I figured out you're the CEO of this corporation, of this organization that they're trying to, uh, to to rob. And over time, they befriend you and they get this information from you that's kind of crucial to get. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I, I want to take it also one step further. We can talk about kind of levels here. Right. I, I like to think of like you're playing at a coffee house. Right. And you've got yeah. your regular coffee house where you go and you get your, your drink and you're sitting there and you're playing your EVE online. And this organization has figured out who you are in the real world, and uh, they figured out where you play, and they sent someone over to uh, casually sit in the coffee house near you, doing their own thing, and then kind of notice you're playing this game and leaning over. Oh, hey, what's that? What are you doing? Oh, Eve Online, never heard of it. What's that like? And over a few weeks, they kind of like, you know, befriend you, look over your shoulder, take your you know, passwords to, you know, protect whatever it is. You, and then they take that information and they use it to infiltrate your organization, assassinate you, and steal your still $16,000, right? Right. Now, when they when you say assassinate you, they, you mean in-game. In-game, yes, in-game, yes. right? We're in, okay, so <laughs> back to the magic circle, right? We're right. in We're in the magic circle, right? Um, so did they cheat, right? So... The, so the, yeah, the, go ahead. I'll go the ahead. Eve community was totally like divided about this. So, I, Andy, right. I want to know what you what you think about this and what this has to do with the magic circle. Yeah. So, um, I think that there was some cheating going on, and the cheating has to do with specifically with the magic circle, uh, because here's somebody who is in the magic circle, um, and somebody who is also in the magic circle but pretending not to be, and that and that. The the in, inherent lie to that is is the cheating part of it, right? Like I'm playing a, I'm playing a game and you sit next to me and say, "Hey, what are you doing?" But it turns out you are also playing the game, but you're pretending that you're not playing the game. Wait, wait, hold on, hold on. I'm so you're, you're, I'm, you're I'm, trying... I'm in I'm in a coffee house. I'm not playing the game at the moment. While right. I do happen to play Eve Online, I'm not at the game right now. Right. And the you I'm talking about is not the you in the game. Right. It's the you that's outside of the game. We're having a real world conversation. Right. Well, we can have, I mean, yes and no. Right. I'm playing the game. You're asking me about game material. I think that you're in the game. We, it's this, a real world conversation on the field is still a in-game conversation. Right. Except that I don't believe we're having an in-game conversation. I think we're having an out-of-game conversation. Okay, so is is the issue here that I mean, look, um, it kind of sounds like you're saying I'm tricking you. Yes, but, that's exactly what I'm saying. But Eve is full of trickery, right? There's nothing sure. wrong with this. Within trickery, the right? game, you can do what you can say and do whatever you want. It's when you are, it's the meta issue of when you are pretending to not play the game. Okay, right, and notice pretending to not play the game, right? That would be really weird, right? If let let's say uh, we're in the basketball court. Right. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm making it seem as if we're taking a break. And right. then I grab the ball and shoot a basket and That's right. count that. Right. Is, are you saying this is something like that? It's exactly like that. I'm saying it's exactly like that. And we see that sort of shenanigans in movies all the time. Right. In sports movies, we see people like uh, uh, pulling those sorts of, uh, oh, hey, I just need to tie my shoe. Oh, I, I got a, I got a, I got, I scored. I, I don't know if I buy that. I, I don't know if I buy the analogy here, right? I mean, yes, the pretending to tie your shoe, right, is, is kind of a, kind of a classic. Yeah. But to me is, I'm not, okay, m maybe this is kind of the, so there's two things here. One, one is this idea of a magic circle, right? Mm -hmm. And whether the magic circle is as uh, closed as I originally made it up to be, right? And then we could talk about bleed and how far, how far that goes. Um, right. But the second one is kind of the issue of, what is the game that we're playing, right? And what yeah. is the, right? So um, when we play basketball, right, I'm a, it's pretty clear to me that we're on the court. And when right. we're off the court, we're not playing the game. But with EVE Online, um, you know, I, I'm not sure that it extends in, I'm not sure that the game is yeah. limited in, in, in the same way. 
Right. I see where you're going. I th I think what you're what you're sort of sensing, I think, is that this sort of magic circle is really kind of concentric circles. Okay. Like in the center of the of in the very center, if you can imagine a target with the individual concentric circles in it, in the very center, the very center target is I'm actually, you know, like flying a spaceship around in Eve Online. You are also flying a spaceship around in Eve Online. We're both playing at the same time together. All right. And then there's, you know, outside of that is um, we are we're we're talking about our plans for playing Eve Online, and we're 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 you know we're we're cooperating, we're doing something together in the game, but we're not actually playing the game right now. But we're talking about our playing the game, and we're talking about the what we're going to do next time we play the game together. So so or, let's say we're having a strategy session. Yeah, a strategy right? session. So we're 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 within we're within one of the concentric circles but we're not in the in the very very center of the concentric circle are we in the game at that point yes yeah okay. and in my opinion mm -hmm. i've always taught my 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 student game designers that as a game designer my my responsibility is your experience in the game from the moment that you hear about the game all the way through the moment that you cease talking about it with your friends so there's this long experience of, of playing this game where the experience of the game and then the game itself is just a center portion of this. Okay. But there's a whole experience around it and there might be community around it. Like there might be, you know, message boards and community boards and, 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 uh, and achievements to unlock and all of these things that you do outside of the game, but you're still in a sense playing the game. Magic the Gathering is a good example of this, where they built this game where you can be playing, you know, one-on-one -on -one game with another player, or you could be at home by yourself building decks for the next time that you play, and you're still playing the game. You're still you're still in the magic circle of Magic the Gathering, okay, but you're so, not in the very center of the magic circle. So preparation for the game is still part of the game. Yes. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Would you? Would you consider this to be these concentric circles? Like, can we talk about the game as, uh, I don't know, in a spectrum of how much we are in the game? We are less in the game, but yeah. still on the I mean, Yeah, sure, right? you can. Because you know, none of these things are, are perfectly binary, right? You're, these things we think are binary choices are actually much more, much more nuanced. Okay, so let's let's look a little more into this whole idea of the, the magic circle then and, and fairness and how much fairness we kind of expect from games with this kind of idea. One, um, one really interesting um, study that I, I read, and this is an old study, I should say, um, from uh, this guy, Richard Page. I think this was in 2006, something like that. Uh, and uh, he's, um, I think, a cultural anthropologist uh, from University of Hawaii. Uh, I didn't do my homework for this, um, <laughs> right? Uh, and uh, he did a study. University of Hawaii does a lot of East-West stuff, which is which is really cool. And he oh, did wow. a study of uh, essentially Chinese versus Western players uh, in terms of how they felt about money in the magic circle. Uh, and because definitely when you're thinking about uh, the outside world coming into, right, the inside world, you can think about, uh, you know, you can think about things like pay to win. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, pay to win is probably maybe the biggest way where this happens. Right. Um, if I could bring my money into the game, um, I could totally make the the playing field not level at all. Right. That's right. Um, right. So in Eve Online, let's say I could I could hire mercenaries, mercenary That's army, right. right? To 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 beat you. Um, I, if I could, uh, if I'm in if I'm in a game, uh, let's say an MMOG, and uh, I can buy better weapons. Right. Mm -hmm. um, right. Or or maybe if uh, I'm in a game like uh, does Class of Cans is Class of Cans uh, Clans uh, pay to win? Uh, I'm not sure. It might be. OK. Uh, let's say in any of those kinds of games, uh, um, Tank World or. Yeah. Uh, right. Uh, that are pay to win. Right. It's impossible to really win unless I bring in enough money, which means unless I bring in enough resources, which means that we're not looking at this competition as being one about skill and drive. That's right. right. Uh, if, if money is coming in there. Now, one good way to explain that is, look, you're ruining the fairness of the game. 
right? You're bringing right. in things from outside the magic circle uh, in and messing up uh, the whole idea of, of the magic circle here. And, uh, you know, the, the idea, so part of this idea of magic circle ethics is mm -hmm. that uh, the worst thing you can do, the biggest moral violation once you're in a game is to break the magic circle, right? Is to bring the real world into the game world. And that's what pay to win seems to do. Now, right. This and there's, but there's a Go long ahead. history of games that, that allow it, right? I mean, if, even thinking about gambling games, let's take poker. If you play a parlor game of poker, that is you, you know, you're just meeting up with friends where you can just, you know, buy more chips anytime you want, or, you know, put it, start putting in watches and things like that. You know, we see this in, in movies and television right. all the time, right? You're in the, one of these parlor games. The person who's going to win that game is the person who starts with the most money uh, because they can always just buy the pot. They can always just, just keep raising right. until the other people can't raise and, and have to fold. Right. And right. So, so when you play in a tournament, when you play you know, a poker tournament, they eliminate that. You buy in for a specific amount. It's a, it's a specific amount of buy-in. Everybody has the same number of chips going in. You can't just start throwing in you know, diamond rings and, and other money out of your pocket to, right, to right. make the bet. Loot for the house. Right. right. So they, they, lay, they, they, they level that playing field. Uh, right. Though, um, and notice, right, this is something that games can do, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so some games, so... So I should point out that, like, the game itself didn't do it. It's the rules around the, the tournament of the game. So that's another sort of concentric circle around the center of the game. You, you know, it's interesting because one of the things that this brings up is what is the game, right? right? And which is, I find, one of the most interesting kind of questions here, right? To me, uh, the poker tournament is just a different game than yeah, it's sort the... of a It's sort of a game around a game, right? Or in a way, right? These are, you know, we can we can talk about this this kind of kind of uh, differently, um, mm -hmm. but um, okay. So so to go back to this Richard Page thing before I lose I lose that that thread. Okay, yeah. uh, so what he did is essentially he looked at the way Western players and Chinese players felt about uh, pay to win, and uh, he examined this this uh, now classic uh, Chinese uh, MMORPG. Uh, and he looked at the way people talked about, um, let's say, buying your way up and then uh, using your power to pick on weaker players. Right. right. This is something that Western players rejected as deeply unfair. Right. And this is kind of part of the why Western players reject pay to win. Right. Right. But when he looked at the at the um, at the forums, uh, the Chinese players were much more accepting of it. Essentially, they seem to. And this is this was the way he kind of described it, and I have no idea how good his uh, research was, but essentially said, "Look, they seem to regard uh, there not to be a magic circle. Essentially, the real world is the world that you play in, right? Uh, you are you in both uh, in both worlds, and you know it's interesting. I don't know if this makes a difference, but uh, you know the way." Uh, People often play in Asia, right? You go to the PC Bang or the Internet Cafe, right, with your sure. friends, and you're there for hours. You don't do it at home, you know, talking to your friends with a headset, like you know, like in the United right. States. Right, it's much more of a social social thing. You're and, doing it with people around you. Right, and maybe this is a part of it of maybe why it's not seen as much as a separate kind of experience because it's already kind of social. Um, but the idea was that uh, instead of thinking that there was anything wrong with just being stronger because you had more money, they tended to view it as a, a more like a, a natural property that you have as a player, right? Mm -hmm. Like being wealthy is essentially the same as like being, you know, uh, clever, right? Mm -hmm. It's a natural property you have. It's just a part of what you're bringing to the table, just like intelligence, just like anything else. Right. Uh, so, of course... Uh, you know, you would be a winner if you brought in money. You're real and re you're a winner in real life, right? Right. Of course, you would be a loser if you don't have money because that's that's where you are in real life. And right. they didn't have the same condemnation of this is unfair. And notice, of course, the game might be unfair with regards to this because that's just life, right? Um, mm -hmm. And they had a different kind of uh, ethical judgment on what you do with what you've got. That's kind of what is the judgment with the bat was about, right? So, so it's sort, 
it's it's interesting, right? Because on one hand, his what his what his his scholarship suggests that there's some sort of some sort of cultural divide, right? There's some cultural divide, um, but if you look at like, so what's more American than baseball? All right. And what's more unfair than the Yankees? Oh man, the Yankees with like a, you know unlimited pocketbook, it seems. Right. Right. And they can you know they can buy whatever whatever they need and uh, get whatever you know hire hire whatever baseball players will make the team best. Is, and is, nobody complains about this in the U.S. So what do you mean? People, co- baseball fans well, complain, have say, complained about this it, for decades. People complain about it, but nobody does anything about it. Right, which is interesting. Aren't there leagues where people do do things about that, where there's a limit to how much uh, a team can spend? Um, yeah, like the the, the MLS, uh, the uh, which is American soccer. Uh, oh, really? Major league, major league soccer. Um, does this where there's a there's a cap on okay. how much you can spend? Um, they they actually have two different caps. They have sort of a special special cap where you can hire stars. Okay. And there's a cap for that, and then there's another cap for your rank and file members of the team. Okay. And mm. uh, and they they use that to try to balance out the teams and try to create a level playing field that way. Okay. Right. I cause... don't know how successful it is, and you know, and... but it's an attempt. But right. it's an attempt, yeah. And and that itself is really meaningful, right? Because, okay, you know, once you're playing the game, so let, let it be baseball, right? Um, right, they all have uh, fairly similar, you know, equipment, right? A, a lot goes into well, the equipment. Presumably, but... Yeah, but I, I, I assume that the Yankees have better training rooms, they have better equipment, they probably get newer bats more often. Who knows well, what they get? Yeah, it's interesting, right? You know, maybe that's a marginal um well, it, it depends, right? Every little bit helps. Every little bit helps, right? Especially and at that level. And it's competitive. Right. It's a super competitive game in a super competitive environment. If it's not illegal, it's mandatory. Again, I'm questioning that, but I'm, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push that apart. But yeah, and right. notice, right? So you've got the situation where the money is not in the game. The money, well, okay, sorry. Let me, let me take a step back here. Because, mm-hmm. you, you know, let's say there's not a big – I'm in the Dodgers and you're in the Yankees. And let's say there's not a really big difference in our shoes and our bats, right? But you bought yourself better teammates, mm-hmm. right? Okay, that's a big, big difference. That's a big difference. Right? Uh, so it's interesting, right? So in some sense here, right, uh, the money from the outside is making a difference even though all of our equipment inside is, is the same, right? We just, we just bought better players. Right. Right. Um, now, um, I'm um, I'm thinking of other um, of other games where you kind of get something uh, where you kind of get this bleed effect. Uh, can you explain by the way what bleed is? Yeah, yeah. sure. So um, bleed is is something that came out of the LARP design community, live action role playing game design community, because we they realized that there's another effect of the magic circle, which is um, things that happen in the magic circle create emotional effects that bleed out into the real world. Things can happen in a game to make you, I mean, we've all seen, we all played Monopoly as a kid. So we know exactly what we mean when they say bad things can happen in a game. They can make you feel bad about your opponents and about your, the other players for, uh, weeks, if not years. Right. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> right, right. Because right. it was easy for me to say in the beginning, right? Me and my friends, we, you know, we were we became different people, but we were in the game. Right. But if I'm I'm invested in the game, and you know, you're yeah, if you like just crush them. If you just crush your friends in a game, you might make them feel badly towards you. Right. I mean, wasn't the point of the game have fun, right? Not to you know, not to be crushed in this way, right? And right. we're taking we're taking our feelings about it, and we're bringing outside of the magic world. Right. And so that's bleed. Bleed is right. when things that are supposed to be inside the magic circle bleed out and affect things in the real world. And and when it when they when they coin this, they're talking about emotions and they're trying to create a, a situation where, you know, they can have they can have intense emotional moments in a game that you when you stop playing the game don't continue to cause you problems or don't don't continue to cause problems within the group. 
Okay. Um, so um, I, I guess let, let me ask you this, right? Um, can we agree here that uh, players and developers both care about fairness? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, very, very much. Very much, right? I, I should say, by the way, that as part of our uh, previous conversations, right, I, th right, that, that thing that keeps coming up, uh, right, developers, uh, game designers care about uh, the players feeling that things are fair, right? That's Philosophers right. care about what is fair. <laughs> That's right. right. And, we, and we care about how, whether it feels fair or not, because we know, we don't really know what fairness is. Which is which is interesting, you know. I I wanted to talk about this when we do our uh, um, our episode about morality systems, mm -hmm. uh, about right the idea of social reputation, and you know social reputation systems are kind of one way to get as close as we don't know what morality is, but your reputation is about as close as we could get, right? Which is a kind of interesting way. As as again, as a moral philosopher. I'm not satisfied with that remotely, but in practical terms, <laughs> it's pretty damn good, <laughs> yeah, right? And and maybe sometimes with the fairness thing, pretty damn good is is uh you know the best that that, that we can get to, right? Um. Okay. So l let let's end on this. So l l mm -hmm. let me just see if I can recap. You know wh where where we are, right? Uh, fairness matters, right? Uh, there's different ways. There's ways to kind of think about fairness, right? Um, game companies and players both want the fairness. The magical circle, right, is one way to kind of think about fairness, right? Right. Uh, that uh, once you enter the magic circle, the game can try to make things as fair as possible. And if you are um, intruding on the breaking the magic circle in some sort of substantial enough way, and we've talked about how it's really imperfect, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Um, then you are bringing an unfair advantage uh, uh, to the game. Um, and, um, you know, maybe the best thing we could do is just kind of uh, think of uh, how can we reduce the kind of uh, the ability to bring things from the outside into a game uh, that affect fairness in a way that's practical. <laughs> right. All right. All right. Uh, right. Then, uh, no, that uh, sounds great. All right, <laughs> then in that case, uh, let, let, let's call it an episode. Um, play nice. You can subscribe and listen to all of our episodes wherever you listen to podcasts.